Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Events 101 panel for Fur Immigration Online. Hope you guys have been enjoying the live stream so far. Um, quick introduction, if uh, you haven't seen me already on the live stream. My name is Vilan. With me. My name is Drake. And uh, together we do a lot of work for the events department in Minnesota Furs. So we'll, we'll talk about today a little bit of uh, what we do with events, how we kind of schedule and, and um, run our events, and um, leading into uh, maybe you guys want to run some of your own events or something like that. And we'll talk about uh, some ideas and how we come up with them and, and hopefully pass on some good ideas to you all and something you'll want to think about uh, running your own events. So what do you want to start with, Drake? Well, the first thing we should probably start with is, well, first off, there are many, many varieties of events, so what type of event are you running? So this could be anything from, let's say, a first food romp, or mm -hmm. community bowling, or say something as simple as just a movie outing. Sure. So, so um, well, let's talk about a first food romp, because I know you do a lot of those with our local community. Sure. Um, what, uh, what are some things you think about when you're, when you're planning that event, putting it together? Well, one of the first things that I think about is location. Um, now, since we're, our community is mainly within the Twin Cities, within the 494, 694 loop, I like to try to find something that's in or around that loop, uh, mm -hmm. preferably in, because a lot of our community is you know, within. So that's when I'll go check out just the many variety of open parks. Um, some are a little bit more remote than others. Some are just literally right in the middle of like the Minneapolis area. Um, yeah, then once I get a spot picked out, then go from there. So I think there's a lot of advantages kind of to both of what you talked about with uh, locations that are centrally located, easy for everyone to get to, uh, might be a little bit busier, which can be good and bad for an event. Um, but I know some of the parks that we've done that were a little bit more out of the way could be uh, interesting too, but you do have to keep in mind, it's a little bit harder for people, might be a little bit harder for people to get to. Um, mm. So you probably don't want to have every event 30 miles outside of town when you could do things in your own backyard. That's definitely something to think about. Um, so you've got a location picked out. How, uh, what do you think about for timing when you're going to host the event? Timing, I like to keep things somewhere in the like the early afternoon, early to mid-afternoon time frame. Sometimes during the evenings, you might have some people that work or a lot of people just don't want to do things in the evening. So afternoon has always kind of been that I'll just say the golden time frame where I've always had like the best turnout for people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then just to backtrack a little bit, uh, just quickly talk about location one more time. Um, I've surprisingly had a lot of luck with some of the ones that have been a little out of the way. Like say if they're even 25, 30 minutes somewhere in a park that's like a little ways off, off mm -hmm. the distance, like that's got more of like a heavily wooded area, yeah. if you will. Because there, it's more photogenic. We can do a lot of like more stage photography setups. Mm -hmm. um, then yeah, then to fast forward, um, yeah, early mid afternoon time frame has usually been works really best. well for something like that. So yeah. if somebody wants to host, um, you know, a romp event like this, um, what do you typically do in terms of uh, notification for letting people know how much how much advance notice do you try to give for an event like this? Uh, usually for not only just for first food rounds, but really any event in general, I like to try to give at least two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like doing it like a week or even a few days before is just unfair because then people can't plan. Right. I mean, people need to plan for, even if it's something as small as getting together with people at the mall, maybe an event like that. Yeah. So um, uh, what about like a smaller event, like a, a mall walk or something like that? Um, uh, in terms of uh, we maybe have a different location if we're doing something like at the, at the Mall of America for the people around here. Um, the timing may be a little bit different, um, probably later in the evening for something like that. So you, you do have to think about your venue, where it is, because a park wouldn't work so well at night, especially if the goal is to get out and get photos, but uh, some evening events at like the bowling alley, uh, the bowling meet, those have typically been later. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings up another interesting thing for venue choice if you're working at a place that is a business, like the mall or, uh, or a bowling alley. So what are some, what are some things that, uh, that you have to deal with when you're dealing with a, a commercial venue, like a business like that? Um, let's take, we'll take bowling as an example, because then that way, you know, we're working with direct staff. So 
that takes a little bit more planning um, just because you're working, you're around general public for one, plus you're working, you're uh, not working, but you're, you're communicating a lot with the staff at, a, at the bowling venue. So first thing is finding a time that works for them to be able to accommodate our group. And then of course, finding out if, you know, if, if it's okay for our community members to be able to costume perform. Mm -hmm. I always try to not use the term fursuit when I'm working with a, any, any sort of any staff because one, foreign term, they don't know what that means. As a matter of fact, that would probably intimidate them to the point where they're just gonna probably say no to us all together. Right. So making sure that we have all of the, all of the rules that they list up to, up to date with us. So, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, and hopefully from there we can get a certain amount of lanes reserved. And then usually with those, I try to schedule those anywhere from early mid-afternoon, even in the evenings. And usually during a weekend, weeknights have just never bird for bowling at all, really. Right. So. It's kind of hard to plan for somebody going out for a few hours on a, on a work night for, for most people. Exactly. That makes sense. Yep. Um, something that is also kind of a, an important thing to note, anytime that you have... Uh, a venue like that, making sure that the staff there have a single point of contact, or if you have a group of people that are helping to wrangle everyone, knowing who's who's in charge, or at least yep. who is a point of contact for the staff, such that if they have issues, they're not going to go to the first person they find. Mm -hmm. They know exactly who to go to, and you build yep. that relationship with them. So that's that's always good. Yeah, that's great. Um, what are some things, let's think about, so if you're doing a, a public event, like at a bowling alley, um, interactions with the public and, and how you can handle, um, what what are some good ways to, to uh, handle that or things to think about uh, before going into such an event? So a lot of it kind of, a lot of it happens on the spot, right? So when, when we've got our certain amount of lanes and we're out having fun, like with people that are not in costume and some that are, when the general public comes to us, um, of course, they're going to have a lot of questions. They're going to want to get photos. Um, I would always say let them let them come to us first with their interactions and their questions, and not you know start getting in their face about it. Like, hey, you know, look right. what look what we're doing, kind of thing. And because yeah. a lot of the general public will either a think it's not necessarily weird, but just too different to where they're just kind of like you know what's what's going on, kind of thing. Right. So. Let, let them come to us and mm -hmm. then just answer the questions honestly with whatever they have. Yeah, pretty much. So. No, that's good. That's good. And that and that does kind of become for like the first week ROMs or a bowling meet like that. When you're the handler, and this is something that I know I've talked about in my uh, first week handling 101 panels, is you're that point of contact. Nobody's going to come up to the first suitor and start asking them questions. Some, some people will, but the vast majority, they're going to come up to the person um, that's that's looks to be in charge, the person that is hanging out with them. Um, and, uh, so be prepared for that. You know, if you're mm -hmm. the, if you're the point of contact, you're the one that's going to get all the questions. So, yep. you know, be prepared to answer them and then answer them honestly and, and all of that. But, uh, just know that that's, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah. And usually, usually with any event that, um, that I do or help somebody else set up, I always recommend that they have somebody as a backup or co-head, if you will, because I've definitely, especially starting off, I've been in a lot of, in a lot of situations where certain questions come up that overwhelm me and not sure how to answer them, or you just get too many questions at once. So right. yeah, be, be prepared to be bombarded unexpectedly too. Yeah. Especially <laughs> some of the, the park outings that we've had. And I know we get, we, on the, the busier days in some of those parks, it's, it is fun, and I enjoy that that interaction. It is fun to watch, but uh, like you said, you know, let let people come to you with their questions, and but be ready to answer them. Yep, that's good. Yep. Um, let's see. So, all of these events, though, really fun, and I do miss them. We can't really do right now, in in our current uh, current lockdown situation. So we really had to change how we were thinking about events for um, switching to more online or distance events and stuff like that. Um, what were, I don't know, what would you consider some of the bigger changes that, uh, that we've had to make in the events department as we're dealing with lockdowns and such? The biggest, biggest adjustment would be 
trying to figure out, okay, how do we take the in-person experience and bring that into a virtual or online environment? Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, we were, just, we were able to start up our own Discord. Mm -hmm. So with that, slowly learning what Discord has to offer from you know, different channels, different voice servers within, whatnot, trying to figure out how to take that into that environment and make it work. Sure. Um, now I know we got a couple of ideas, mm -hmm. like saying trying to do like say a virtual first food romp or a virtual social hour or virtual coffee meet. Um, right. And then yeah, just trying to kind of figure out how to make that work. Yeah. So. Yeah. So a virtual first food romp. We talked about how to do, you know, like a, a first food romp at a picnic or at a at a park or something like that, finding a venue. Mm -hmm. Um the virtual first suit romp, what are what are some things that you're thinking of as as we start designing this event? Um, well, the first thing would be get a designated channel set up for it, mm -hmm. and then for anybody with a fursuit, anybody with a webcam, um, just get everybody in that channel, and then, yeah, just... So it's kind of, I mean, it's like the, the park meets, but the venue's figured out because it's going to be online. Right. Uh, the time is, is mostly figured out. I mean, that's... Yep. Most people are online kind of late afternoon, early evening. We could use that as a good time for it. Um, so we've we've got all of that. And though we can't really get the same in-person experience, we're, we're doing what we can to try to bring as much of it into a virtual event mm -hmm. as you can. Um, one event that I know is being advertised during this, this live stream is uh, the, um, for, or the uh, distance and virtual Pinewood Derby uh, that Minfers is putting on. Um, so that's an example of uh, an event that we would love to do in person, but we're trying to think how can we do something, um, something a little bit creative and fun, maybe a little bit different, but still keep people distance in mm -hmm. that we're letting people build the Pinewood Derby cars on their own time at home, ship them to us, and then we're racing them and live streaming the event. And that's kind of using, like using a Discord server, we're using the, the tech and resources that we have to do live streams like the Fur Immigration Online live stream, and we're using that um, uh, those resources to bring an event uh, kind of online. And, and again, like yep. you said, trying yep. to bring more of that uh, in-person experience as best as we can. You know, so this way we'll have a, a Discord for people to hang out and chat with as we're doing the live stream. People can still chat on the live stream, that kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so there's still a a um, there's a social aspect in it even though everyone is distant. Yep, and then also, also it's kind of cool about that virtual experience, like whether it's the Pinewood Derby or the first or, or the virtual first food run, or really any other virtual event idea that we have is that once they see, you know, like, oh, I see that, like a couple of my friends are in there, you know, and then they'll hop on, and then that's kind of a way to kind of get everybody else to come on as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, get, yeah, you know, even people that maybe not be, that may not be uh, participating in the event itself, they can spectate and they can enjoy you know the the event that we're putting on everybody can kind of get involved in it yep um and kind of an upside of if you're doing a, a live streamed event like that and you can record it we can post that later and that stuff that people can still enjoy and it's you know video content we can post and and mm -hmm. have out there so that's that's kind of a, a cool uh aspect of that too yep yeah um what else so we've talked a bit about Kind of making an event um, locally, some some bigger events, some smaller events. I mean, we have here in Minnesota first. We used to we'd have pretty scheduled the biweekly coffee meets and yep. Perkins meets that we used to do, and um, so there's and like our bowling meets. We try to keep them fairly regular when we can, and same for your fairly, your first yeah. week romps. You know, we we try to as as much as we can. Scheduling yep. obviously getting in the way, but. For people that maybe want to bring these kinds of events to their own community, um, having a, a area that everyone can watch, so a, a Twitter account or a Telegram channel that people can watch for posting events when people want to host stuff. Uh, like for us, we have the forums and, and Discord and Telegram now, quite a few options yep. for people. And there's social media platforms too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are all those are all very useful to have. Um, what. Uh, what are some other considerations you can think of for? Um, well, let's talk. Let's talk virtual events now. So if we're doing if we're doing online events, uh, some other considerations for for people to keep in mind as they're building their own events. Um. Gosh, where do you even start with that? So, since we have to 
for now with the pandemic, keep it isolated to a virtual environment. Um, I guess first thing is just figure out what you want to do. Like, is this going to be something as simple as far as just getting a group of your friends together with, say, a cup of coffee or something like that? And that can just be something as simple as just starting your own channel, having the option to just do video and voice. Um, if you're going to do something that's a little bit more elaborate, and that can be something like, oh, what's a bigger example? Well, so you could just go back to, say, a virtual first or drop idea. Yeah. Um, again, figuring out the date and time you want to have it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, just trying to figure out, is this something that you're going to keep, you know, isolated to just a few of your friends? Right. Or if you are going to advertise this to more of the greater and first community, then um, we have other other ways to get word out there. Like we do have an event submission form that is on our on our forms, the event first forms. Mm -hmm. So from there, once we once we get that information filled out, then we can start advertising it on our event first website. Um, other social media outlets like say Twitter, Facebook. Um, I can't remember if we have any other ones outside those ones or not, but oh, those are those are kind of our primary. That's what I thought. But you bring up a good point. So the the event submission form, something that. Minnesota Furs and our, our events department has grown to is we still try to host some events, um, mm -hmm. some of the ones that, that we run and we put on, but one of the things that we're really trying to push for is uh, the community engagement and letting people say, yeah. hey, I've got an idea for an event. Um, I want to I wanna help bring that to the community. Um, and that's something that can be really important too for people is uh, if, if you kind of end up becoming the person that helps run the events, I mean, it's, it's fun, but... We, we have our own scheduling limitations. We can't run events all the time. So Exactly, yep. And um, now, yeah, and since you bring that up, um, I feel like that's something, like, between myself uh, and the rest of our staff that we're, it's kind of like we're just still trying to figure that, out, figure, that out, figure that out every day as far as what is the proper way to engage community, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I've tried so many different, things like just from simple forum posts to asking like just some simple questions on social media right um part of that could be just a community member just doesn't know where to where to even begin with that right is it something where if we can provide them like say a combination of documentation and something you know like once the pandemic is over yep. Yep. some in-person teaching like whether it's like say a panel at an oval meet like give them a combination of that and then they'll feel comfortable to, you know, if you will, Do take off with it. Yep. So that's that's our number one challenge right now. Is is getting <laughs> other people to help help run events, yep. yeah. Yep. But I think I think that's and from working on the convention side and on the society side with our event staff, that's always been the issue with everything is is volunteers and getting people um, motivated to help with the events. That's that's definitely something we, we always deal with. Um, you know, we really like running these events. We want to see them grow and, and do well, but, um, and we enjoy people that get to come and enjoy the event and, and have a good time, but it does take, take quite a lot of work to put some of these right. events together. And it's, yeah, it's like we can't be, can't always be just the two people right. like, throwing out all the fun parties. Right. <laughs> so We can, but we're just not going to invite anybody to them anymore. <laughs> um... Let's see. So we talked a little bit. Um, are there any financial advances for the event? So events that may take uh, may take some amount of uh, financial requirements. Um, either booking a venue space, so mm -hmm. yep. like our work with the uh, with the Oval, um, or events that because like our, our park events are free admission. Anybody can show up. Anybody can go there. Yep. Um, and uh, and this actually brings another thing that I want to talk about. Um, but ones in businesses like bowling meets or the coffee meets where, you know, there's a, at least an intention that people are going to spend money at the venue that you're at. Yep. And that's something to think of um, when you're planning the event and making sure that you advertise out there to people that, you know, hey, here's the cost of entry or here's kind of what the suggested um, amount is or something like that. And when you host an event like like the coffee meet, making sure people understand like, yes, it doesn't cost anything to get into the venue, but there is that intention that 
we're gonna we're gonna uh, support the business that we're at. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's kind of like our annual picnics. Mm -hmm. um, while it's free to attend, uh, to come and have fun, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that went into it. Like um, again, uh, reserving the uh, park pavilion. Um, all the amenities that come with it. Yeah. You know, we have a certain uh, deposit, like deposits, we have to put down for damage fees, um, right. and all the other fees that entail with that yeah. too. So, and we have the advantage with Minnesota Furs that we have the society and, and the ability for the society to cover some of those costs. But mm -hmm. I do know uh, personally some events that I've run um, at parks that you know it's not mine. Should be like a twenty dollar deposit to rent a, a park shelter. Um, if yep. you're running an event kind of stuff and um, putting, you know, hopefully in an event, uh, if you get a big enough event, people may be willing to donate and, and that, that does help. But sometimes it does, you're putting your own money into an event and that's, that's kind of the, just the, the cost of the event running. Yep. And just to give an example of that, there's been a couple of the past bowling meets that I've put, like just for example, like I put maybe 50 or 60 bucks into say rent out a little party room for like first year changing tilt storage mm -hmm. and for anybody that's deciding to do that really it's it's up to that it's up to that person who's running it if they want to put forth any of their own you know financial expenses to it right. now the nice thing is depending on what kind of what kind of event is what sort of financial burdens are going into it we do have a reimbursement form so for example like some of the like whether it's oval meat or like our annual holiday parties which mm -hmm. have had a cost to do it you know i'll put in maybe 100 150 bucks just because i know like it's worth it but again we got reimbursement forms but it's up to there there's moments where you'll run into that and it's up to you you know if you want to do it right, right. <laughs> and and hopefully up to the community to to help donate and pitch in and keep those kinds of, uh, of events going definitely yep, definitely helps keep those going mm -hmm. um, some cons we've talked about setting up for an event um, we've talked about some things to, to think about during the event um, after the event um, one thing that I know that's big especially when you're dealing with uh, a business or so the bowling meets or some of the movie nights that we've done if you have mm -hmm. a contact with somebody making sure you follow up because uh, that yep. goes that goes Very a long important. long way yeah. Uh, just reach out and, uh, you know, hey, thanks, you know, hopefully there weren't any issues that there were, let me know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because even if you don't plan to do another event at that location, you've at least set up a good relationship. And, and if you are trying to do recurring events at somewhere, uh, that, that can be critical because not fostering that good relationship, you're not going to have a venue to, to host your event at for yep. much longer. Yep, and then another thing to remember too, when you're the, especially when you're the one hosting the event, you're always the last person to leave. Mm -hmm. um, you know, always make sure talk to people during the end. You know, hey, did you have a good time? Like any questions, concerns, and then yep, you're the last person to leave. Yeah. Well, and that and that's also the, the um, earlier point about making sure if you have a second person, you know, if somebody's there to help set up. If it's a much longer running event and one that maybe you can't be there for the whole event, mm -hmm. you know, somebody yep. takes good point, point on setup of the event. Somebody takes point on teardown. Yep. And if you have a point of contact at the venue, making sure they know, you know, hey, either of us work, but I'll be leaving partway through the night and they'll be here for the rest of the night and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Yeah. And then um, just kind of touch touch up more on what you had mentioned. Um, then like a day or two after, uh, email the person that you were working with, like let's say after a holiday party at the Oval or somewhere else, mm -hmm. yeah, just touch base if there's any questions or concerns. Was there maybe they saw something with cleanup that wasn't quite the way they wanted it and like just getting every little detail and then improving upon that to continue growing that relationship right so. right well and i remember um the uh the opening night of zootopia we were able to uh first suit at the imax at the minnesota zoo that was a yep. that was a really fun event but that was one of those um going into it i got told oh there's no way they'll allow it there's no way they won't be able to do it you know they won't let you do that and I just called them up and I said, all right, here's a weird, weird request, but can I talk to whoever's going to be the nighttime manager? Got talking to her, explained who we are, what we wanted to do. Just, hey, this would be a cool night. It'd be really fun to be there on opening night. Mm -hmm. And 10 minutes on the phone and she had perfectly okay with the event. We went. We had a great time. Uh, she was actually very, uh, she made 
very sure to tell me that I had to take pictures because she wasn't going to be there that night <laughs> and she wanted to see. So she's like, make sure you send me pictures afterwards because she wanted to see it. So That's great. And I emailed her afterwards just thanking her for the event, sent her the pictures, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, even though we didn't do another event at that venue, it was good to have that good relationship and such that if I do come back, um, you know, if we do try to run another event or something there, we we've, remember we've that got, experience. Exactly. Too. Yeah. yeah. And you had some good pictures out of it. So. Yep. And um, it's also another thing that a lot of people don't realize that um, it can be just as, just as simple as a conversation of just calling up, you know, hey, I've got this idea. Um, and sometimes they're okay with it after 10 minutes of right. talking on the phone. Yep. So. Yeah, even those ideas that, you know, they are a venue that oh, they probably won't let you. And usually just put a face to, you know, ha- a, have that that uh, kind of face to face that good connection with them. Explain here's what we want to do, and maybe they say no, and you say, okay, or maybe they say I want to understand a little bit more about it and explain it, and then you might you might uh, find that they're completely okay with that, as as we've run into, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and another another point to think about as well is we surveyed the uh, venue and made sure that. You know, we, we uh, didn't have any issues with the venue and, and all that stuff, but also serving the people that went to the event. Mm-hmm. Did everyone have a good time? Did anybody have any comments? You know, because the people that attend, yeah, it was good, but that's that stuff that you can improve upon at future events. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something to, to make sure you, you reach out and get uh, from the attendees as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially for a lot of people starting off running events, um, it's also a confidence thing. Like I know, just with when me with me starting off, like five six years ago, um, you know, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna be rusty, but it's those mistakes that you learn from, mm-hmm. and then over time, when you're you know helping helping new people come on board with getting their event off the ground, then you can kind of share those experiences and right that networking is, that networking is a, is important. Yeah, yep. and that's the thing. I mean, it's. You want to host an event, and it's something that maybe you have a good idea of, and you put together, and maybe it goes well, and that that's awesome. People enjoy. It. Maybe it doesn't go as well, and that shouldn't keep you from doing more events. It's just mm-hmm. learn from the mistake, learn from what happened. It happens. You know, maybe you uh, you burn a bridge with the venue. You know, we we try to avoid that as much as possible. We don't want that to happen, but it sometimes it does, and it's uh, it's unfortunate. It's one of those. Yep, you know, not the greatest, but. Learn from it, move on. Not going to make exactly. that mistake again. Definitely. Yep. Well, good. Um, I guess probably some... I'm trying to think if there's anything else we should cover. Some closing thoughts. and Really, if you have, like, for anybody that's out there that wants to run an event, if you have, you know, if they have any questions, we've got, you know, events at edmundfurs.org and... Plenty of, plenty of resources to reach out. And that's a, even if it's not in our local community, but somebody that just has a question on that kind of stuff, like you said, networking with other people and learning from other people's mistakes. And there's, there's a lot of people out there that have helped put together uh, some really good events. And those are, mm-hmm. those are good people to reach out to and uh, learn from. And hopefully people can go host their own fun event, uh, hopefully soon when we can start having in-person <laughs> events, but uh, yes. for virtual or online events. And and it is kind of interesting through all of this is I've I've been thinking about now that we're doing all of these virtual events and how, how can we integrate what we've learned from this year into uh, into in person events to try to you know maybe get more people uh, to have access to an event and that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting interesting idea. We'll just have to see how things evolve over the next next couple of years. Yeah, and especially like on the virtual side too, like once we get back to being able to do in-person events, if things if things kind of flow really well on the virtual side, I think that's going to also open up the avenues for like say a more bigger variety of in-person and the virtual side of it too. So mm-hmm. could potentially open some open up some more opportunities. That's good. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else to, to add in? I think we've we've covered quite a lot. I think people, again, if anybody has any uh, questions, they want to reach out to us. Events at mnfirst.org goes to both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, we're happy to help people out and, and uh, answer your questions as best as we can. We appreciate everybody tuning in for the panel. Hope you enjoy the rest of the live stream this night, and I uh, hope everyone has a very happy new year. <laughs>